When it comes to serial killers, more often than not, they're men. But every once in a while, you hear stories about these savage women who slay a bunch of people, typically in very cunning ways. Leonardo Cianciulli was an Italian woman, fortune teller and soap shop owner who fit that description perfectly. She is said to have slain at least three women and turned their flesh into soap and tea cakes. Now, how insane is that? Now, by the time that Leonardo went after her first victim, she had already been through the ringer. Her mom was basically forced to marry her father, so Leonardo grew up in a super toxic and abusive home. Leonardo tried to end her own life on two separate occasions before marrying a dude in 1917 who her mom absolutely hated. Because of that, her mom put a curse on her marriage and Leonardo was extremely superstitious about it. Over the course of her marriage, Leonardo got pregnant 17 times, had three miscarriages, and lost 10 of her other children when there were babies, which left her with only four of her 17 children. When World War II came around, Leonardo's husband left her and her oldest son, Giuseppe, told her he'd be enlisting in the army. Now, considering the amount of loss Leonardo had already experienced throughout her life, she didn't want to lose Giuseppe too. So that's when she was like, oh, the only way to protect my son in the war is to make human sacrifices to God, because that makes total sense. With that being said, let's meet victim number one, Faustina. One day, Faustina confided in Leonardo about her loneliness and desired to find a husband. In response, Leonardo said she knew of a nice single man in a nearby town who would be a great fit for her. Leonardo told Faustina that she'd write him a note and arrange a marriage for the two of them. Whoa, not even a first date? She told Faustina that he agreed agreed to get married to her and said she had to travel to his hometown so they could be together. So Faustina, who was desperate for a companion, packed her things and planned to elope and move in with her new beau. But her beau didn't exist. It was a setup. Oh, snap! Now, December 17, 1939 was the day Faustina was set to move. Before leaving, she went over to Leonardo's for one last visit, which ended up being her very last visit with anyone, ever. So when Faustina came over, Leonardo convinced her to drink some wine to celebrate her new life. The wine was poison. After Faustina collapsed, on the floor and took her last breath, Leonardo drained her vital fluid into a bowl and chopped her body up into nine pieces with an axe. Fucking yikes. Now this wasn't your average slice of body up and dump the pieces crime. Instead, Leonardo boiled the pieces in a large cauldron and got out all the supplies needed to make soap. Yeah, soap, like the kind you use to wash your hands, wash your body in the shower and all that stuff. Now once the body parts were boiled to Leonardo's liking, she added 15 pounds of sodium hydroxide or caustic soda, which is an ingredient typically used to make soap. Only Leonardo did didn't turn this mixture into a bar of soap, thank God. Can you imagine washing your hands with melted body parts? Ew, gross. Instead, Leonardo stirred up her human soup until all of the bits and pieces dissolved into a thick, dark mush that was poured down a septic tank nearby. But Leonardo wasn't finished there. Remember how I told you she drained Faustina's fluid into a bucket? So she waited for it to coagulate and then stuck it in the oven to dry up. From there, she ground up the crusty DNA and mixed it with sugar, butter, flour, chocolate, milk, and eggs. Sugar, butter, and flour. This is like the horror version of Waitress. But instead of pies, Leonardo made tea cakes that she served to her friends and family, including her son, Giuseppe. Gross! Yuck, dude. This girl is whack. And after that, Leonardo took all of Faustina's life saving as payment for her matchmaking services. So at this point, you're probably wondering, didn't people notice Faustina missing? Well, I'm sure you can already tell Leonardo was a sneaky woman. She thought this whole thing out for a while because she made Faustina write a bunch of notes to her friends and family to say she wouldn't be in touch with them much because she was moving and getting married. But she reassured them that everything was fine and she was doing well. Little did they know, Faustina had been poured into a septic tank and cooked into tea cakes. Dude, what the fuck? All right, anyway, so now let's move on to victim number two, Francesca. Francesca was a kindergarten teacher who was looking for a new job. Leonardo told her that she could get a job at an all girls boarding school in another city. She said everything was set up and directed Francesca to write letters to her friends and family, just like she did with the other victim. And then on September 5th, 1940, Leonardo offered Francesca a glass of wine. When Francesca went limp, Leonardo grabbed her ax, bowl, and cauldron and did the same thing with her body as she did Faustina's. Also, I wonder what the family thinks about what these tea cakes taste like. That's what I want to know. Really, seriously. Leonardo then made Giuseppe send out the letters. He didn't know what they were for, but he did as his mother said. And after that, she stole money from Francesca, which again, wasn't much, but Leonardo had no problem pocketing it. And now for victim number three, Virginia. Virginia was a former opera singer who was in her mid fifties. One way or another, she linked up with Leonardo who told her she'd get her a secretary job with an impresario, a, AKA a producer in Florence. Virginia stopped by Leonardo's pad, probably to discuss the made up 
up gig and uh, in true Leonardo fashion, she gave Virginia a glass of wine and reached for her ex. But instead of only making tea cakes, Leonardo turned some, some of Virginia's melted remains into soap. But then again, I guess I'd rather wash my hands with the deceased than actually eat them. As her final move, Leonardo snatched Virginia's money, jewelry, clothing, and shoes. Because hacking her with an ax and turning her into a knockoff Irish spring bar wasn't good enough. Now onto the good part, catching Leonardo. So Virginia wrote notes like the other two girls. When her sister-in-law got the letter Virginia wrote her, she suspected something was up. Virginia's sister-in-law started getting more and more suspicious, so she finally went to the police to report Virginia as missing. She told the officers that the last time Virginia was seen, she went over to Leonardo's house. At First, Leonardo acted like she had nothing to do with Virginia's passing. But when the authorities began pursuing her son, Giuseppe, Leonardo immediately confessed to everything. Since a literal world war was going on, Leonardo wasn't taken to trial until 1946, which was six years after she was initially caught. And finally, on June 12, 1946, she took the stand and confessed to her crime. She acted almost proud of what she had done. Leonardo's trial lasted almost a week. The court had a hard time believing a woman could dissect a human body with such speed and precision all by herself. So to settle the debate once and for all, Leonardo was allegedly taken to a morgue where she proved her talent by cutting up a corpse into nine pieces in less than 12 minutes. Wow, that's fast. Wait, why would they willingly allowed her to do that to somebody's body? About a week after after her trial began, Leonardo was found guilty and sentenced to three years in an asylum and 30 years in jail. With that, it was off to the asylum for Leonardo and that's actually where she stayed for the rest of her life until passing in 1970 from cerebral apoplexy. During her time in the asylum, Leonardo wrote a memoir titled An Embittered Soul's Confessions. In her book, Leonardo touched on all the best practices for turning human body parts into soap. Ah oh, yes, because I've been looking specifically for a guide like that. Although Leonardo is no longer with us, her stories will most definitely be in our nightmares forever. Thank you for that. So here's where things get tricky as they normally do in most criminal cases. What was Leonardo's motive? She believed she could protect her son by sacrificing other humans, which makes absolutely no sense. In what world does slaying three innocent women protect your son in a world war? I don't know. And even though Leonardo was superstitious AF, there aren't any religious ideals out there that talk about sacrificing humans. Roman Catholics actually forbid the act as it is believed to be an abomination before God. A lot of people believe she battled with a mental illness along the lines of anxiety or depression, or a mix of both. If you think about it, the woman lost 13 of her kids in horrific ways. On top of all that, the woman was born into an awful situation, cursed by her mother, and left by her husband. It's safe to say she was not in a good mindset. And the fact that she literally gave friends and family tea cakes and soap bars made with human flesh, now that's disgusting. On that note, I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Thanks for watching. Today, get ready to sink your teeth into a mind-boggling case, the intriguing story of the disappearance of Heather Bogle. I'm your host, Brandy. Let's get into it. On April 15, 2015, a 28-year-old woman named Heather Bogle disappeared. Heather was a mother to her five-year-old daughter, Mackenzie, living in Sandusky County, Ohio. Heather had been in a relationship with a woman named Carmela Badillo, but they had been having a rocky go at it recently and weren't on the best of terms, breaking up prior to that night. Apparently, the two of them had met at a work in the Whirlpool factory and started dating. Their problems began when Carmela began to think Heather had been sneaking around with other women. She even wrote a strongly worded letter expressing her feelings about their failed relationship and sent multiple texts indicating she couldn't rely on Heather, that Carmilla was alone and that the only person she could truly trust was her mother. She followed up through texts stating that she had never wanted to speak to Heather again in this lifetime. They had many arguments, but on the previous Wednesday, they had a particularly bad one. It looked like their relationship was over for good. But that's not all. Heather had been attending nursing school and had just finished her courses. That same week, she took her nursing exam to become a registered nurse. She failed. Not only that, but when her brother, Josh Fiesel, found out, he responded by lashing out at her. He texted her hateful messages, calling her too stupid to pass and typical trash, a disappointment like her mother and father. Harsh, isn't it? Heather just wanted to provide for her daughter, giving her the best she could as a mother. All of this was happening at the same time, April 5th, 2015, the very same week she disappeared. 
Heather was last seen leaving the Whirlpool factory floor at around 6.17 a.m. on April 8th, that morning on a surveillance camera. This would be the last time she'd be seen alive. Two years before her disappearance, she had attempted suicide due to her battle with depression. After that, she was admitted into a hospital and prescribed the antidepressant Lam because of this, when she went missing, her mother and law enforcement feared she had made another attempt at her own life. A search was quickly underway. Within the next 24 hours, they would find Heather and her family's fears would be realized. April 10th, 2015, Heather's car was located outside the Summerton Apartments on Hickory Street. It was parked in a parking spot at the edge of the apartment lot. This led officers to believe that she had to have been somewhere inside or around the apartment complex. The interior of the car was empty, left in the same condition prior to her shift ending on the 5th. This is where the officers had found the handwritten note from Carmela to Heather. The night prior, Carmela had had a serious medical emergency requiring her to be taken to the hospital. Heather was unable to do anything due to her having a shift at the factory that night. That made Carmela feel less important to Heather than her job, and she spiraled, sending nasty worded messages through text. This is what officers had theorized to be the reason for the bad blood between the two. It also led to Carmela becoming one of the first suspects in her disappearance. The second, her abusive brother. You know, the one who called her demeaning names and chastised her for being too s to pass the nursing exam. His hatred for her was no secret to any of their family or friends. The only question was, could he have done anything to her? It wasn't until they opened the truck that they realized the truth about her disappearance. Inside, they found Heather's body. She had been murdered. Heather was found in an oversized red Mickey Mouse t-shirt, bruised to hell all over her. Marks around her wrists and ankles like she had been bound or handcuffed her hair shredded off close to her scalp and her fingernails cut to the cuticles. There were defensive wounds all on her hands, which officers attributed to her blocking hits from her assailant. The cause of death had been surmised to be the two gunshot wounds in her back. Forensics stated that she had fought with all of her might until the moment she had died. Even though her nails were cut, investigators managed to find DNA evidence of the attacker under what was left. The perpetrator may have tried to hide their crime, but they didn't do well enough. Unfortunately, there were no matching samples on file in the police database. So the police did what was only natural, canvassed the area and questioned those in the apartment around the area for witnesses. The case had taken a hard left turn from missing persons to a homicide. At that time, her keys, wallet, work shirt, and phone had all been missing, and the officers had hoped to locate the items. One officer, Detective Sean O'Connell, dismissed the potential suspects, Carmela and Josh, quickly. The police had questioned Carmela, and it had become clear in the interview that she was not responsible for the murder. After a brief survey of the area and questioning a witness claiming to have seen a hooded figure drive the car into the parking lot and leave it the night of April 9th, sometime between 1.30 a.m. and 3 a.m. It had been reported by tenants in the Summerton Apartments that Heather was no stranger to the complex. A resident had told officials that she had frequented apartment building 240 to purchase marijuana from one of the residents living there. Although this was never confirmed, Officer O'Connell began searching the building with purpose. During the investigation, the police turned their attention to Kiona Bohr, a single mother residing in building 240 at the apartment where Heather's body was discovered. They got her name when they found a complaint lodged against her by another resident, noting the smell of marijuana coming from her room. Soon after, Detective O'Connell made the connection that on the day Heather went missing, Kiona made a comment on Facebook suggesting she could face eight to 10 years for murder and pleading insanity. When questioned by police, Kiona was supposedly very nervous, and for Detective O'Connell, this was odd behavior for someone who denied any involvement. O'Connell wasn't convinced. But then the plot thickened as another person of interest emerged, Omar Satchel. Omar had a history of run-ins with the law, serving time for home invasion and possession of a firearm. Interestingly, Omar was reportedly present in Kiona's apartment the night Heather's body was found. 
Coincidence? Maybe, but the police were determined to connect the dots somehow. According to law enforcement, they received information from an unknown source suggesting that a third person may have been involved in the crime, Omar's friend, Kerry Jeffrey. They assumed he played a role in disposing of the murder weapon. The investigation took a wild turn as the police tried to piece together a connection between Kiona, Omar, and Kerry. The biggest piece of evidence was that Kiona was seen wearing a similar Mickey Mouse shirt around the complex similar to the one Heather was found in. And lastly, Detective O'Connell also mentioned that Kiona had previously been in a relationship with a man Detective O'Connell had put away for 10 years on a first time offense. For the detective, the evidence was irrefutable. But were they mere coincidences or crucial puzzle pieces in Heather's case? Only time would tell as the authorities worked to separate fact from fiction to bring justice to Heather Bogle. When the authorities were approached by Heather's mother or any of her loved ones on why they hadn't questioned any of the others on her shift that night, they were met with dismissive remarks and the insurance that O'Connell had the culprits in sight. The officers brought Kiona in for multiple interviews in an attempt to scare her into a confession of guilt in the murder of Heather Bogle, along with her accomplices, but Kiona repeatedly denied ever even knowing the victim. Kiona was even unaware of the report filed against her for the smell coming from her home. In the interviews they had with her, there was no evidence presented that tied Kiona or any of the people she knew being involved in the case of Heather Bogle. It seemed like O'Connell got tunnel vision and tried to force a confession. Unfortunately, the case hit a roadblock, and it later came to light that the detective in charge of the murder investigation, Sean O'Connell, had not been completely transparent in his handling of the case. His actions raised suspicions, and it was discovered that he had not shared all of his findings with the appropriate channels within the police department. Later, during the investigation, officials were able to interrogate Omar Satchel for the murder. Omar stated after the interview to reporters that Detective Sean O'Connell had said, I know it's not you, but I'll make it you. The detective denied that he had ever threatened Omar, but the truth is still unknown. Omar's whereabouts for the nights in question, both during the murder and disappearance, put him in public bars and at Keona's apartment while the murder took place. Either way, the detective was adamant that he could have easily traveled back and forth to commit the crimes. Lastly, Kerry Jeffrey was last seen with O'Connell's smoking gun. Kerry was reported to have thrown something like a black bag into the nearby river on April 10th, 2015. Presumably, the bag contained the gun used to kill Heather Bogle. An entire dive team was dispatched to search the bottom of the river. They found nothing. There was no evidence any of the three had been the murderers, but the detectives still pressed forward. That's when a crucial piece of evidence was brought forward. Remember the DNA under her fingernails? It had finally been analyzed and cataloged. All three suspects in the investigation for the last year and a half were soon dismissed. None of them were matches. The situation became so serious that Detective O'Connell eventually resigned from his position. Soon after, an investigation into O'Connell's investigation tactics yielded better results than his case. Detective O'Connell faced a disciplinary hearing as he was accused of sharing confidential documents related to the case and evidence tampering. These allegations were not taken lightly. Eventually, he pleaded guilty to one felony count, specifically tampering with evidence. It turned out that he had omitted the DNA results that excluded Kiona, Omar, and Kerry as suspects from the beginning. The severity of his actions was acknowledged and he received a sentence of two years in prison. Kiona, Omar, and Kerry, the individuals who were under intense scrutiny, were found to have no involvement in Heather's murder. It's a reminder that sometimes even the most obvious seeming suspects can turn out to be innocent, and the truth can be obscured by the mistakes and misconduct of those in charge. But that doesn't solve the case of who killed Heather Bogle. In reality, it only brought the police back to square one. Heather's case stayed unresolved, haunting the community for two long years. It wasn't until Major Nick Katsopoulos, a fresh face determined to shake things up and breathe new life into Heather's case, entered. 
They carefully dissected the case, re-examining every piece of evidence, every witness statement, and every lead that had been overlooked. It was a meticulous process, guided by their commitment to uncovering the truth. In a not-so-surprising turn of events, Major Katsopoulos swiftly ruled out the top three suspects that Detective O'Connell had previously focused on. Why? Because he followed the evidence trail, and it led him down a completely different path. There simply wasn't enough substance to connect them to the crime. This time, they decided not to fixate on any single suspect, but instead, they retraced Heather's final known steps, determined to unveil the missing puzzle pieces. Soon, the investigators were led to her digital footprint, checking into her email and social media activity, hoping to uncover any hidden clues that could shed light on her final moments. Now here's where technology came to the rescue. Heather's GPS records were fortunately stored by Google, creating an electronic trail of coordinates that could unveil her exact whereabouts. It was like following a digital breadcrumb trail, getting them closer to the truth. It was the morning of April 9th, and at precisely 6.17 a.m., Heather took off from her shift at the Whirlpool factory. But what happened next? The coordinates from Heather's GPS records provided a clue. 13 minutes later, at 6.30 a.m., the data revealed that she was inside a trailer home just a few miles away from the factory at a place called Emerald State Trailer Park. Now here's the kicker. Heather seemed to have spent around an hour inside the trailer home. The investigators' minds were buzzing with questions. So the police decided to pay a little visit to that trailer home where Heather's GPS coordinates led them. And guess who they stumbled upon? One of Heather's co-workers, a guy named Daniel Myers. A new suspect? The plot thickens, again. Daniel had never been questioned about Heather's murder before. Can you believe it? Well, maybe you could, seeing how incompetent the previous detective was. It seemed like a pretty big oversight, considering he was living in the same place where Heather had spent that mysterious hour, according to her GPS records, which no one apparently looked into. Investigators sat down with Daniel for an interview. He wasn't under arrest yet, but investigators were itching to get to the bottom of this. They wanted answers. Turns out, Daniel and Heather were on the same shift the night of April 8th, working side by side. And here's the interesting part. They both left work at the exact same time the following morning when their shift ended. Was this just another coincidence, or was there more to the story? When questioned by the police, Daniel claimed that he didn't really know Heather. He had only heard of her, you know, in passing. So naturally, he couldn't wrap his head around why they were talking to him more than two years after the murder. The whole situation must have seemed like a huge twist for him. This was it, a startling revelation that led the investigators straight to Heather's co-worker, Daniel Myers. A connection that had remained undiscovered for over two years. When they showed up to his trailer, Major Katsopoulos proceeded to be cordial. He approached Daniel nicely and asked him if he knew Heather or anything about her, sparking up a conversation to get him talking. After the brief interview, the police did their due diligence and politely asked Daniel for a DNA sample. But guess what? He declined. The investigators weren't about to let that slide. They swiftly obtained a warrant, allowing them to get their hands on Daniel's DNA, whether he liked it or not. They analyzed the DNA sample from Daniel, and you won't believe what they discovered. It was a perfect match to the DNA found under Heather's fingernails. Can you believe it? Police decided to do a little deep dive into Daniel's trailer, hoping to uncover some more concrete evidence. Their eyes were peeled for any trace of the murder weapon, but alas, no gun or bullets were found. However, what they did stumble upon was just as suspicious. Check this out. Less than a week after Heather's murder, Daniel went out and bought new floorboards, pieces for this very particular section of his trailer's flooring. Talk about suspicious timing, right? And that's not all. He also bought himself a brand new mattress and waited a few months to go to the dentist and fix a chipped tooth he had received sometime in early April. Now, why on earth would someone make such peculiar purchases right after a murder? The investigators couldn't help but put two and two together. Their theory? Heather met her tragic end right there in Daniel's trailer, shortly after leaving work that morning. 
It sent shivers down their spines to imagine the dark secrets that might have unfolded within those very walls. But wait, there's more. Police also stumbled upon multiple women's underwear hidden away in a safe right there in his trailer. And if that wasn't shocking enough, they also discovered videos of Daniel with various women beside them. And when we say with, I think you know what we mean. In the aftermath of Heather's murder, the pieces of the puzzle revealed a deeply unsettling truth about Daniel. The gravity of his actions extended far beyond a single crime. As the investigation progressed, an alarming pattern emerged. 10 women bravely came forward, sharing their painful stories of being sexually assaulted by Daniel. The accounts were chillingly similar. When faced with rejection, Daniel's behavior turned violent and aggressive. His victims recounted hair-raising experiences of being forcefully grabbed, thrown against walls, or violently slammed to the ground. It was a wave of horror that left a lasting impact on these courageous women. The legal proceedings unfolded, and Daniel found himself at a crossroads. The possibility of the death penalty loomed ominously, and he was faced with a life-altering decision. Accept a plea deal or risk the death penalty. He took the deal. This choice meant that he would avoid the ultimate punishment, but would forever remain confined behind prison walls until the end of his days. The judge delivered the final sentence, a life term in prison without the possibility of parole, along with an additional 20 years. It wasn't until Daniel was behind bars that he would truly confess the details of his crime to his cellmate. According to the fellow inmate, Daniel revealed a chilling motive behind Heather's murder. He claimed that it all stemmed from a moment of humiliation. You see, Heather had apparently laughed at him when he made advances towards her. But that's not all. Daniel stated that she confided in him about failing the nurse exam, her relationship failing with Carmela and what her brother said to her, and he saw an opportunity to console her. However, his fragile ego couldn't handle rejection, and offense turned into something far more sinister. So let's get real here. Deep down, Daniel knew Heather better than she was aware. He frequently drove by her house, and they worked side by side on the factory line. Daniel would have observed her emotional state during that fateful shift, sensing her vulnerability. He cunningly saw a chance to take advantage of her, preying on her distress and personal turmoil. Heather was going through a lot, but she never saw Daniel in that light. Little did she know he had ulterior motives behind his facade. When Daniel invited Heather to his trailer that morning, he had a plan in motion. It was a calculated move driven by his twisted desires. But let me tell you, Heather fought back with every ounce of strength she had. She was a force to be reckoned with. In fact, Daniel later confessed to an inmate that she even managed to break his tooth during the struggle. Unfortunately, her valiant efforts weren't enough to save her life. But here's where things take a turn. In a desperate attempt to cover his tracks, Daniel resorted to cutting Heather's fingernails, hoping to eradicate any trace of DNA linking him to the crime. However, the forensic investigators managed to collect crucial evidence, the DNA that would later be matched to Daniel himself. It was Heather's last stand that became a beacon of hope for other potential victims, sparing them from the same fate. Now here's the mind-boggling part. Daniel thought he could get away with murder. For a brief period, it seemed like he did. In fact, he had the audacity to make sure he was noticed. He attended Heather's funeral, signed the book of condolences, and even had the nerve to donate $125 to a GoFundMe campaign set up for Heather's daughter. It's almost as if he wanted to revel in his own twisted sense of power and control. His attitude after the murder and his ease in being noticed begged questions and sparked uneasy rumors and questions. Had he done this before? Now here's where the plot takes an even more bewildering turn. There is no concrete evidence or any foundation for this to stand on, but there was another woman in Daniel Meyer's life who had inexplicably committed suicide. Leanne Sluter, another employee of Whirlpool and his ex-girlfriend. She was also the mother of his son. Leanne, 38 years old at the time, was found lifeless in Clyde, Ohio. The circumstances surrounding her demise were perplexing, to say the least. 
According to Daniel, he discovered Leanne's lifeless body in her own bed on the 1st of March, 2009. The initial investigation determined that Leanne's death was a tragic suicide by gunshot wound. The case appeared closed until Heather's murder cast a spotlight on these interconnected tragedies. Authorities decided to reopen Leanne's case, hoping to uncover any overlooked details. Ultimately, they reached the same conclusion based on the existing evidence and photographs from the original investigation. During the reopen investigation, Daniel's relatives provided authorities with a shocking piece of evidence, a suicide note they had discovered among Daniel's belongings. This heart-wrenching letter was addressed to Daniel and revealed Leanne's inner torment. She described feeling like an empty shell, claiming that Daniel had worn her down, used her for financial gain, and callously discarded her when someone else caught his eye. The discovery of the note shed new light on Leanne's tragic fate. She was found with a single gunshot wound to her chest, with a 22 caliber rifle found nearby. These disturbing details raise countless questions and leave us pondering the true nature of Leanne's untimely demise. But karma has a way of catching up. The truth unraveled slowly but steadily, piece by piece, until Daniel's web of deceit came crashing down around him. Justice was served, and he was held accountable for his heinous actions. I'm Brandy, and this is Killer Bites. Thank you for watching. Happily Ever After turned into every spouse's worst nightmare. A 23-year marriage that ends in a ruthless affair, a shockingly diabolical plan, and a fatal poisoning. So how did this supposedly happy marriage end up splashed across tragic headlines? James Craig and Angela Craig lived in a sleepy community of Aurora, Colorado, where they both worked as local dentists. Angela was known to their friends and family for having an unbound sense of humor and a quick wit. She was also recognized as an active member of her church. Others who knew her best said she was a great mom who was supportive of her six children and her husband of 23 years. Craig was also well-respected in their town and thought by many to be an intelligent and hardworking man as well as a deeply religious person who came from a good family. Over the course of their 23-year marriage, they had six children and were thought by members of their church and neighborhood to be a very happy couple. But those suspicions, as you will find out, were very, very wrong. On March 18th, 2023, this quiet town would be rocked forever by a shocking turn of events. But the story really began a few weeks prior when Angela began to have suspicious symptoms like dizziness and severe headaches, odd for someone who was known to be in pretty good health. Angela went to the gym often and loved her protein shakes that her husband made for her. But in the weeks leading up to that fateful Thursday morning, Angela's health took a rapid turn seemingly out of nowhere and her seemingly benign symptoms only got worse and worse causing her to seek to go to the hospital multiple times. In fact, on March 6th, Angela was so worried about her waning health that she texted James, I feel drugged. Rather than reply with concern or support, James responded back, given our history, I know that that must be triggering. Just for the record, I didn't drug you. I'm super worried though. You look pale before I left, like in your lips even. Wait, what? Given what history? Why would that text be triggering? What was really going on in this suburban marriage? And why would James feel the need to say, I didn't drug you? Shouldn't that be like obvious? If Angela had only known then about James, what the world would later discover. Even though Angela went to the hospital more than once in two weeks, she still couldn't figure out what was causing all these weird symptoms. Unfortunately, the hospital couldn't give her concrete answers. Even though during these hospitalizations, James had said he did not think his wife was going to make it, but she did pull through and she was sent back home with no answers. Angela hoped for the best and tried to go back to normal life, but unfortunately the worst was still in front of her. On that fateful Thursday, Angela woke up feeling under the weather again, but after three hospital visits and no results, she probably wanted to just try and push herself to return to her normal routines. So that morning she went to the gym and then when she came home, James made her a protein shake like he always did. It's something that James regularly did for Angela and something that later would become the center of this horrible case. On this particular morning, Angela drank the shake hoping it would make her feel better, hoping anything would make her feel better. Unfortunately, the shake did not help Angela's symptoms. In fact, the exact opposite happened. Angela's symptoms began to get much worse. 
much, much worse. And over the course of the morning, Angela's health took a deadly turn until her condition completely deteriorated. She went from feeling faint and dizzy, which were consistent with her other symptoms, to having full on seizures. At that point, James finally called 911 for help, but unfortunately, when the police arrived, they found Angela lying on the floor of her bedroom. Angela was quickly rushed to the hospital again, but this time Angela was put into intensive care and on a ventilator. A few days later, Angela was declared brain dead and taken off of life support on March 21st, 2023. For someone who was relatively young and in good health, this surprising and heartbreaking series of events made no sense and sent shockwaves through their entire peaceful community. How could a beloved church going woman end up dead in the span of a few weeks? It all didn't make any sense. And it didn't make sense to some of her friends and family either. But the story clearly doesn't end there. During Angela's autopsy, it was revealed that she had been poisoned with arsenic and cyanide, a startling discovery to say the least. But this new information could finally explain all of Angela's suspicious symptoms. Symptoms that had brought her to the hospital multiple times in the last few weeks and symptoms that most likely kills her. Arsenic is a highly toxic substance that can cause a variety of symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, headache, dizziness, and seizures. In high doses, arsenic can be fatal. And in the tragic death of Angela Craig, it absolutely was. So very quickly, Angela's passing went from tragic mystery to a murder investigation. But who would want such a wonderful woman dead? Who would have the motive to poison an innocent mother? Unfortunately, the answer was way closer than anyone could have suspected. Or maybe some of Angela's friends and family did suspect who could be behind her bizarre and tragic death. And that's when the story takes a terrible turn. With few suspects that could have any motive for wanting Angela dead, and investigators quickly focused their attention on James Craig. And what they found quickly unraveled more layers of betrayal than anyone could have ever imagined. The investigation found that James and Angela were not in the seemingly placid relationship some in their community imagined. In fact, Angela and James had been having marriage problems for a long time. And a police warrant that was later issued revealed startling and surprising details about James and Angela's turbulent relationship that painted a dark picture of the couple's troubled relationship. And it was quickly discovered that close friends and colleagues of Angela suspected that James may have played a role in poisoning her and that he may even had a history of poisoning her. Those same close friends and colleagues all went to the police with their accounts and suspicions of James. And in fact, when Angela Craig was at the hospital on March 15th, one of Craig's business partners told a nurse that he suspected Angela might have been poisoned by James, a hefty accusation against James a man that has been otherwise respected in his community. So what would lead James's business partner to come to this sinister conclusion? What would cause someone to make that leap? Well, it turns out that this story is even more intricate than it seemed at first glance. See, that same business partner that had known James and Angela for more than 20 years, and during that time, James had confided in him that he and Angela were not only having bad marital problems, but also having bad money troubles. Knowing all of this information about Angela and James, James's business partner could not overlook this next set of suspicious incidents that occurred at their office. James's business partner told the police that James had recently had an order of potassium cyanide shipped to their dental office. Whoa, <laughs> wait, wait, what? So James actually had poison sent to his own dentist's office, like a public office where multiple people were able to see this package. More on the surprising series of events later, but clearly there was a lot more going on with James than anyone knew. James's business partner recognized that there was no medical reason for such a substance to be at a dental practice and instantly became suspicious of James's intentions. But there was someone who had always been a little suspicious of James even before the poison literally landed at James's office's doorstep and that someone is Angela's sister. Angela's sister had long known that Angela's marriage to James was not going well, and would later tell the police that the marriage between Angela and James had always been tumultuous. Angela also conveyed to the police that James had multiple affairs with several women and had been addicted to pornography. So James was not the upstanding man that he pretended to be at all. Angela's sister also shared with the authorities that Angela had told her multiple times over the years that she was going to leave her husband, but didn't which could have given James a reason to want to poison her. Or was there something else? Tragically, Angela's sister said that James always convinced her to stay. Now, a troubled marriage may not seem like a motive for James to drug Angela, but this story is far from over. What Angela's sister revealed next was shocking and proved that perhaps James had more than one skeleton in his closet. 
Angela's sister explained to the police that Angela had told her that James had tried to drug her before. Again, this is completely shocking. But Angela's sister said that Angela had discovered to her that several years ago, James Craig had tried to drug her without her knowledge. At the time, James said that he had intended to die by suicide and didn't want Angela to interfere. Again, this all sounds so bizarre. Like who would poison someone else while they were trying to kill themselves? None of it makes any sense. Angela's sister said that James had tried to drug Angela five or six years before she died. So when Angela was having symptoms of being drugged, leading up to her death and texted James, maybe he thought that she was accusing him. And this absolutely explains James's suspicious text back that he wasn't drugging her. As Shakespeare says, thou do protest too much. So could James have been suicidal again? Could that be why James may have been ordering poison to his office? Is that why James was seemingly poisoning his wife? Now, according to James's office manager, who was the first person to discover the odd package at James's office, said she recounted seeing the strange delivery arrive. When she found the package, it had already been opened. And she saw a biohazard sticker on what was inside with a label that said potassium cyanide. At the time, the office manager didn't know what the substance was, so she didn't know that there would be any harm in giving it to James. And besides that she remembered James telling her that he was expecting a delivery and not to open it. So the office manager gave James the package, but something about the whole thing didn't feel right to her. The office manager was also aware that James and Angela had been having marital issues. So later on, the office manager did a Google search to discover what potassium cyanide was and was startled to discover that it was poisonous and it had been delivered to James's office. But that wasn't the most shocking part of her discovery. Potassium cyanide had the potential to cause all the symptoms that Angela had been exhibiting the last few weeks, including nausea, vomiting, and low blood pressure. Alarmed at all of this new information, the office manager immediately contacted another colleague within the office and relayed that all she had found out. And that coworker then told James's business partner about the contents of the package and its shocking nature. It was then that James's business partner confronted James about the odd package and surprised to be confronted by his business partner, James quickly retorted that the suspicious package was actually a ring to surprise Angela. But with so many witnesses, this story didn't make any sense. So the business partner persisted and grilled James about the suspicious package. After all, it's not every day that you get poison delivered to your office. But when James was confronted further about the potassium cyanide, James told his business partner that he had bought it at Angela's request. Now again, I'm confused. Why would Angela want poison? Is James trying to suggest that Angela was going to poison herself? Then James admitted to James's business partner that he did not think that Angela would actually take it. This case just keeps getting more and more strange. This is clearly a very weird thing to say, especially since Angela had not been known to be suicidal. In fact, James had been the one who had supposedly been suicidal years earlier. James would later repeat to the police that Angela was suicidal, but during the police's eventual investigation, they found no evidence whatsoever of Angela being suicidal. With all the strange events unfolding at once, Angela and James's marital issues, their ongoing money problems, Angela's hospital visits, the actual poison that shipped to James's office, it was too much for the business partner to ignore. Getting really uncomfortable by James's confession, the business partner then told James that he should get a lawyer before he tells him anything else. <laughs> yeah, I would say he probably needed a really, really good lawyer. And after the confrontation between James and James's business partner, James sent a text to his business partner on March 15th. And in that text, James asked the business partner not to tell anyone about their conversation. James told the business partner in this text message, I have to hire a homicide attorney to make sure I don't end up being painted in the light that you know some hungry DA is anxious to paint me in because I am most likely going to be charged even though that is absolutely not what happened. Again, this only adds to growing lists of suspicions, interactions, behaviors, and events. But if James did poison Angela, what was his actual motive to end her life? Money, marital problems, porn problems, and why now? What, what could make him snap now? Well, what the police discovered next might just give us the answers we've been looking for. See, James Craig had been having an affair with another woman, a woman that he was actively sleeping with while Angela was in and out of the hospital a woman that perhaps he thought he would be able to be with if his wife was no longer around. James was having an affair with a woman named Karen Kane, 
who also happened to be married. Whoa. And what the police found out was that the affair had been going on for several months before Angela Craig's death. So let me rewind a little bit. James Craig had met Karen Kane, who was a Texas orthodontist at a dental conference in 2022. Clearly smitten with each other, the two started talking and quickly hit it off, which is where it should have ended. But unfortunately, it's only where it began. And looking back, I'm sure neither one of them thought their affair would end the life of a beloved woman. But in this case, it looks like that's exactly what it did. Shortly after meeting, James and Karen began to have an affair. An affair that Angela and Karen Kane's husband knew absolutely nothing about. James and Karen kept their affair a secret by meeting up in remote hotels and other discreet locations to keep their respective spouses from suspecting anything. They exchanged emails and text messages, but they were very careful not to leave any evidence of their relationship. Emails that would later provide even more sinister evidence against James. James and Karen both went to great lengths to make sure no one found out about their love affair. That being said, James was determined to keep this affair going no matter what was going on at the home. What was discovered later was that while Angela was sick in the hospital in the weeks leading up to her death, James arranged for Karen to fly to Colorado to visit him. In those emails about the trip, police found evidence that James was using new email accounts to hide his affair, where the police found letters that were intimate in nature and contained sexually explicit conversations. These same emails were also used to place several orders of poison, which is a truly disturbing revelation to say the least. And as a warrant later stated, it appears that James was flying this woman into Denver while his wife and the mother of his children was dying in the hospital. And to make James's actions even more deplorable, it appears that James planned more than one trip for Karen to come to Colorado during this time. And even after Angela's condition took a deadly turn, police included in the warrant an email allegedly from Karen, in which it appears that Craig told her something had happened to Angela. So James was poisoning his wife and mother of his six children and lying to his mistress. The deeper the investigation went, it became clear that James's affair with Karen was a deep motive for James to end Angela's life. Investigators speculated that he might have thought that if Angela Craig was dead, he would be free to be with Karen Kane. As the police would later reveal, in totality, this investigation has proven that James has gone to great lengths to try and end his wife's life. And two days before Angela was declared brain dead, Karen wrote James an email expressing sympathy about what he was going through according to the document. However, Karen said she did not think it was right for her to mix him with those who had gathered to mourn Angela because she did not want to conceal what I felt for you. So clearly James and Karen's relationship had grown and James was desperate for it to continue without his wife in the way. And tragically, it appears that James's plan worked. As the layers of the investigation peeled away, it was revealed that over the course of several months, James searched on YouTube and Google with topics like, how many grams of pure arsenic would kill a human? Is arsenic detectable in an autopsy? Top five undetectable poisons that will show no signs of foul play how to make poison, and the top 10 deadliest plants, they can kill you, according to the affidavit. And finally, James Craig had ordered arsenic from amazon.com on February 27th, police allege, and he received the package on March 4th. Then it was only two days later, Angela was admitted to a hospital with symptoms that aligned with arsenic poisoning, according to the affidavit. Angela was released from the hospital that day, but returned to the hospital again on March 9th, again with similar symptoms. And this time, while Angela was in the hospital on March 9th, James Craig ordered potassium cyanide from a medical supplier. James told the seller that he was a surgeon and intended to use the potassium cyanide for a medical procedure, which obviously was a complete lie. Then he proceeded to give the seller his dental license number and work email but used a newly created personal email, jimandwaffles at gmail.com to order the poison. Of all the emails to choose, James chose that one. What slowly became evident to investigators that James was slowly poisoning his wife, Angela. And every time Angela was hospitalized, James Craig continued to order more poison. In fact, he ordered two additional poisons, cyanide and oleandrin, from medical suppliers, according to the affidavit. He never received the oleandrin because the package was intercepted by police. The thing about the poisons James was using is that they were very hard to detect. So it makes sense that the hospital could not figure out what was happening with Angela. And James might have gotten away with it had he not made so many public mistakes. And if it weren't for Angela's sister, see, Angela's sister also told police that she had to push James Craig 
to have an autopsy performed on Angela in case she died of a genetic condition that might have passed on to one of their six children. A reasonable request, but James clearly hiding his nefarious deeds refused. Angela's sisters recounts James said he felt that if they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her, and when she was alive, he wouldn't let them poke her more when she was dead, which could have sounded reasonable if James wasn't already displaying so many other suspicious behaviors. Thank goodness an autopsy was eventually performed on Angela, which obviously led to the discovery that she was slash had been poisoned to death. This couple with the physical evidence against James that was extremely overwhelming, which also included investigators finding arsenic and cyanide in his home and in his car. Additionally, they also found a receipt for a purchase of arsenic from a local hardware store. As if this story couldn't take a weirder turn, it would later be revealed that the day before Angela's death, James recruited members of his church into helping him clean up a potential crime scene at his home. According to a source close to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, South Shore Ward, which was the church that James and Angela attended, members were asked to help organize Craig's mudroom and basement at their home in Aurora while Angela was in the hospital and ahead of other family coming into town. It was an oddly specific request. It's, a, it's quite common in the community for us to go into someone's home and help when there's been a new baby or sickness, but the language of this request was so heightened and caused some to wonder what this really was all about. And as well as the statements from his office manager and his business partner about the arsenic and cyanide delivery to his office. The same source says, now looking back at the timing of the communication, I can't help wondering if that was something Jim asked for, knowing that it might be a crime scene later. This strange request was sent to church members via email shortly after 1 p.m. on March 17th, before Angela was officially pronounced dead. That being said, major crimes homicide detectives had already executed a search warrant on the family residence the previous morning. In less than 24 hours after the church member's search, Angela by then intubated and unconscious in intensive care, was pronounced brain dead. Now at first, James refused to speak to a detective from the Aurora Police Department when he was visited by them at the friend's home on March 16th. So they executed the search warrant on this home approximately 15 minutes later. The police then recovered multiple items for the Craig household, including protein powders, workout style shakers used to consume protein drinks or shakes, a computer tablet, water bottle, and two different plastic Ziploc style bags, neither of which were labeled and both of which contained white powdery substances in them. So despite James sending his church group over to try and maybe clean up the crime scene, police still found evidence against him. And even after all this happened, James sent an email to his church group asking them to remain tight-lipped about what had happened to Angela. The email read, thank you for your continued prayers and tremendous support for the Craig family. Thank you for the yard work, the meals, the housework, and the love that you have generously provided. The family's grateful, I am grateful. Many have reached out inquiring about recent news. We don't have many answers, but wanted to provide some counsel. One, Jesus is the Christ. Be his disciple. Mosiah 2, 172. Think of the Craig children. How will your communication potentially affect them? If you're approached or asked questions about the situation from the public, please refer them to President Hansen. We don't judge, we love, we minister. I don't think there were any number of emails James could have sent to his church community or to anyone else to stop his arrest. And that's exactly what happened to him. James Craig was arrested on March 20th, 2023 on suspicion of first degree murder, shortly after his wife died after being taken off of life support during her last trip to the hospital. Aurora Police Division Chief Mark Hildenbrand called Angela Craig's death a heinous, complex, and calculated murder in a statement released following James's arrest. The James Craig's trial began on March 28th, 2023. He appeared in person to hear the charge of first degree murder after deliberation formally filed against him. The James Craig trial began on March 28, 2023. He appeared in person to hear the charge of first degree murder after deliberation formally filed against him. James shuffled into courtroom 308, head bowed, handcuffed and ankles shackled. He did not make any eye contact with any of the family and friends who filed into the courtroom to support him. James sat alongside Deputy Public Defender Patrick Thompson and Public Defender Katie Telfer. And inside the courtroom, several of James's older children were present. They sat silently and betrayed little emotion as their father entered the court, which is an experience no children should ever have to endure. 
During the brief hearing, the judge deferred a defense request to put a temporary gag order on Aurora Police Department. Deputy Public Defender Katie Telfer raised the motion objecting to statements made in Aurora PD's chief in a press release on Craig's arrest, which she said were tantamount to a presumption of guilt. James spoke only briefly during the morning's hearing, which lasted barely 10 minutes, as he confirmed that he was waiving his right to a preliminary hearing within a 35-day period. During the trial, the prosecution's case was based on circumstantial evidence, a lot of the evidence that we have laid out above to you. The prosecution argued that James Craig had the motive, means, and opportunity to kill his wife. They also presented evidence that James Craig had been acting strangely in the days leading up to his wife's death, the deliveries, the sneaking around to cover up his affair, etc. The prosecution relayed that the evidence against James Craig was overwhelming. First, there was the fact that he was the only one who had access to Angela's protein shakes. Second, there's the fact that he had a motive to kill her. James Craig was in debt and was having an affair. He stood to inherit a large sum of money from Angela's death. Third, there's the physical evidence. And like I mentioned, investigators found arsenic and cyanide in James Craig's home and in his car. Fourth, James was a dentist. So he had access to a variety of medical supplies, including arsenic and cyanide. The prosecution argued that this gave James Craig the opportunity to poison his wife without raising suspicion. Although in James's case, he did raise a lot of suspicion. And fifth, there is a testimony of witnesses. Several people testified that they saw James Craig acting suspiciously in the days leading up to Angela's death. For example, one witness saw him buying arsenic at the hardware store. Another witness saw him arguing with Angela about money. The prosecution argued that all these reasons listed above were evidence that James Craig was planning to kill his wife. But still, the defense argued that James Craig was innocent. They said that the evidence against him was circumstantial and that there was no physical evidence linking him to the crime. James Craig was seen by many as a loving husband and father. He was active in his community and he was well liked by his neighbors. The prosecution argued that this made it more difficult for people to believe that he was capable of murder. The jury deliberated for four days before returning a verdict of guilty. James Craig was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Neighbors of the family told reporters that they were stunned. I keep praying for the kids because they lost both parents at the same time, said a neighbor. The neighbor went on to say, I got a card and put together some money for the family. I haven't given it to them yet because I just found out what really happened. A coworker of James said, we're all just in shock. He was a very good guy, like the least likely person for any of this. They were the nicest, sweetest family with such cute kids. I've looked back on memories over the past few days to see if there's anything I missed that hinted at anything that would explain this at all, but there's nothing. He would give motivational speeches and do food for the staff some afternoons. James's brother said about the case, we're heartbroken. I'm still trying to put into words what she means to all of us. James's brother went on to say, we're all pitching in to look after the children. That's our focus. With a lot of compassion, James's brother said, his family is wonderful. They have a young family too, and it's great for the children to, to be with them. His family didn't do anything wrong. He did. Angela's family released a statement and said they're heartbroken over the loss, but also grateful for the compassion and concern they've received from others since her death. Angela's family went on to say, we're all heartbroken over the loss of our sweet Angie. She was deeply loved by both the Prey and Craig families. And this is a very difficult time for all of us. We thank God for the knowledge that we will be able to be reunited with her someday. We're overwhelmed by the love and service extended to us by those who knew and loved her here in Aurora. We're also grateful for the compassion and concern everyone has shown for Angie and would ask for your continued thoughts and prayers. We also invite you to allow us some time to mourn her passing in privacy. The case of James Craig is a tragic example of domestic violence. It is a reminder that domestic violence can happen to anyone, regardless of their social status or economic background. Domestic violence is an issue that does not discriminate. It affects all people, regardless of race, gender identity, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. It affects children, our friends, and even our pets. To understand relationship abuse, we must recognize that it's more than physical violence. Ending the harm and stigma of domestic violence requires a nuanced understanding of the behaviors that define it, as well as the examples of healthy relationships to inform your decisions and interactions moving forward. There are advocates that are available 24 seven by phone or live chat to help discuss your situation and help you determine if your relationship might be abusive. Domestic violence, also referred to as an intimate partner violence, IPV, dating abuse or relationship abuse, 
is a pattern of behaviors used by one partner to maintain power and control over another partner in an intimate relationship. Domestic violence doesn't discriminate. People of any race, age, gender, sexuality, religion, education level, or economic status can be a victim or a perpetrator of domestic violence. That includes behavior that physically harm, intimidate, manipulate, or control a partner or otherwise force them to behave in ways they don't want to, including through physical violence, threats, emotional abuse, or financial control. There are multiple types of abuse that are usually present at the same time in abusive situations, and it's essential to understand how these behaviors interact so you know what to look for. When we know what a relationship looks like and means, we can then take steps to get help for ourselves as well as better support others who are experiencing abuse. If you are in an abusive relationship, there is help available. To contact the National Domestic Abuse Hotline, call 1-800-799-7233. Thank you all so much for watching another episode of Killer Bites. My name is Mac and we'll catch you guys on the next one. How do you try a murderer in a case where there is no body? What if an overwhelming amount of evidence points to one person, but the victim's body is never recovered? Can you be sure your suspect is really guilty? And can justice truly be done for the victim if they're never laid to rest properly? My name is Brandy, and today I'm going to tell you about the murder of Leslie Herring. Leslie's case made headlines in February of 2009 because her body was never recovered. However, a suspect was still arrested and charged. Murder trials without a body are rare. An unofficial estimate states that there have only been 300 such cases in the United States. These are difficult trials for prosecutors, as without a body, a case hinges heavily on circumstantial evidence. Would the evidence surrounding the disappearance of Leslie Herring be enough to convict her murder? Leslie Herring was 44 years old and worked at Simplex Grinnell, a fire alarm and security company in Los Angeles. She was well liked and respected by her fellow employees. Many of them gave her their old construction hard hats when they moved on to different work or retired. Leslie kept every single one of these hats on a well-organized shelf above her desk. She was by all accounts a creature of habit. Leslie called her mother every morning to pray, kept her home neat and tidy, and almost never missed a day of work. When these patterns were disrupted, when Leslie didn't call her mother or show up to work, her friends and family began to get concerned. Leslie's sister, Asha Davis, is an actress who has appeared on Grey's Anatomy and Friday Night Lights. When Davis received a call from Simplex Grinnell that Leslie hadn't shown up to work in two days, she instantly knew something was wrong. It made me nervous and uncomfortable because it didn't sound like her, Davis would later testify. She doesn't just go anywhere without telling anyone. She likes doing the same thing all the time. Doing something new is unusual for her, Davis said. So who do the police first look to in a missing persons case? The spouse. And in this case, they wouldn't need to look any further. Lyle Herring, 56, worked as a recruiter for California State University, Northridge. He and Leslie had been married for 11 years. They'd met at a 99 cent store and instantly made a connection. Lyle showed Leslie around town and the two seemed to get along very well together. They were inseparable. They married within a year of meeting and looked to be genuinely in love with one another. Leslie and Lyle went everywhere together and even dressed alike. Leslie's mom would say that Lyle was closer with her family than he was with his own. Despite this, there were differences between them that would lead to problems in their relationship. What are some major differences that can lead to relationship problems down the line? Most involve money. Others involve personal habits such as cleanliness. The Herring's case would include both of these. Leslie was extremely organized, had a steady job, and was fiscally responsible. Lyle, however, was the complete opposite. He had trouble holding down a job and constantly found himself with money troubles. Leslie confided in her mother that Lyle's financial insecurity was putting a strain on their marriage. From the sound of things, he may not have even been pulling his weight around the home. Her mother replied, what did you expect? You met him in the 99 cent store. But there was one major issue here. Lyle Herring was also missing. He would not be found for another two weeks. Could something have happened to both of them? 
Was it possible that both of the Herrings were victims here? In the meantime, police would search their home. The Herrings lived in a gated condominium in Hollywood. By all initial appearances, nothing was amiss. The house looked very clean, very nice, except a couple of things that we noticed offhand, LAPD detective Chris Gable said. One example of things not being quite right in the Herring home was some spilled candle wax on the counter. This may seem like a small detail at first, but from what the police had learned about Leslie from her family, that was likely not something she would have left home without cleaning up. An important find for the police during their search was Leslie's 1998 red Toyota Corolla parked at home. Within it was something even more concerning regarding Leslie's disappearance. Her purse, ID, keys, money, cell phone, and ATM card were all inside the trunk. Being as organized a person as she was, it didn't make any sense for Leslie to leave these important items behind if she left voluntarily. But had she left voluntarily? Also discovered at the home were Leslie's favorite bracelets. Leslie was known to wear her favorite Guyanese gold bracelets every day. They were found inside a different purse on the floor of her closet, along with a Starbucks receipt dated a few days after she disappeared. Leslie's mom knew she would never leave her purse there. Leslie believed in an old proverb, purse on the floor, money out the door. The saying comes from Feng Shui, an ancient Chinese practice that seeks to harmonize individuals with their environment. Essentially, the idea is that the floor is a bad energy place to leave a purse. Practically, it means that floors are dirty and impractical places to leave valuable belongings. So for someone as obsessed with tidiness as Leslie, it's unlikely she'd leave her favorite bracelets in a purse on the floor, let alone leave home without them. Other than the signs that something was amiss at home, the police had nothing to go on. There were no signs of Lyle or Leslie Herring. Was it possible that both Lyle and Leslie had been taken? Had there been some sort of accident that landed both in the hospital or worse, in the morgue with no identification? Then a week after the police conducted their search, Lyle was pulled over by a customs officer as he tried to re-enter California from Mexico. Detectives had plenty of questions for Lyle regarding why he was in Mexico, but their most pressing question was, where is Leslie? Lyle would tell investigators that he and Leslie had plans to visit Rosarito Beach for Valentine's Day. Rosarito Beach is a resort town in Mexico, known as a nightlife hotspot for American visitors due to its proximity to the border. They'd had an argument before they left and she ran off. She ran off without telling anyone at all? Did Lyle think the police and Leslie's family would buy this? Lyle said he decided to continue on to Mexico to see if she would meet him there. He then stayed there for an entire week. But Leslie's family had never heard of this vacation in Mexico from her. Leslie was a meticulously organized person who told her family everything. Would she really take a spur of the moment trip without telling her family, friends, or even employer? Additionally, Leslie's sister, Asha Davis, had just given birth to a son. Leslie would never walk away from her sister and nephew when they needed her. Something was wrong with Lyle's story. When the police spoke with Lyle, they also noticed that his dreadlocks and goatee had been shaved off. According to Lyle, he'd owed money to some shady characters and they shaved them off as punishment. This baffled the police. As Detective Gable said, I worked the gang unit for several years and I've never ever heard of some gang members holding someone down to shave their head and shave their goatee off. So that was a first. Despite all this circumstantial evidence, the police had no real reason to keep Lyle detained, so he was released. In their search of the Herring's home, the police had also found a letter written by Leslie. The letter was addressed to Lyle. Within it, Leslie expressed her concern over some of Lyle's poor financial dealings. Had Lyle found the letter before she meant to share it with him? Maybe she just used it to get her thoughts together before confronting him. Was this what they had argued over before Lyle ran away to Mexico? Leslie's mother would further tell investigators that Leslie had told her she'd been thinking of leaving Lyle. Was it possible that Lyle had discovered that Leslie was thinking about leaving him? 
Maybe Leslie had even confronted him and he reacted poorly. Exactly what happened is still unknown. But then the police started to catch some breaks. Remember the Starbucks receipt found in Leslie's purse? The same purse holding her favorite bracelets suspiciously left on the closet floor? It had been dated after she had disappeared. They hurried to check the security footage of the Starbucks before it was automatically erased, expecting to see Leslie. Instead, they only saw Lyle, alone, purchasing a drink. Detective Gable would later go on to say, we thought that was pretty suspicious. Was it really designed for us to find that? Maybe it was meant to be discovered much later in the investigation, when the now old footage would have been automatically deleted. They suspected Lyle planted the receipt in Leslie's purse in an attempt to guide the investigation away from himself. In the moment, Lyle probably felt this was a brilliant attempt at throwing off investigators. As it would turn out, this was only the start. Lyle's attempts at misdirection would be his undoing. There were several calls logged between Leslie's phone and Lyle's phone during her disappearance. However, Lyle failed to take into account how closely cell towers can track a phone. Records showed that the phones were in the same general area as one another when the calls were made. As if Lyle had held both phones in his hands and simply dialed one from the other. Another big break came in the form of Lyle's search history. Some searches included profile of a mass murderer, violent death and the soul, and 10 common methods of suicide. Other were relevant to his flight to Mexico, such as U.S.-Mexico border, U.S.-Texas-Mexico border, and do I need a passport? He also visited websites called which country do I flee to and what's the weather like in Belize? Do you think these are the internet searches of an innocent man, or are they those of a man trying to flee from justice? Police would then speak to people in the Mexican resort town of Rosarito Beach, where Lyle had been for the first week of Leslie's disappearance. He'd shown up there with his dreadlocks and goatee already shaved off, asking about buying a nightclub. A real estate agent he spoke with would later testify that Lyle claimed to be a millionaire. According to the agent, Lyle said he had a lot of money that would be available shortly. Lyle spent a week in Mexico before returning to the US. Why did he come back? Was his money running out? Maybe he feared he hadn't done enough to cover up his crimes. Back in the United States, Lyle was still trying to push the story that Leslie had run away. But her family and the police were having a hard time believing that she had dropped off the radar to escape him. These claims only made him look more and more like their suspect. Additionally, Leslie's family was finding Lyle harder and harder to get a hold of as he dodged their calls. If he was truly concerned for Leslie, wouldn't he want to work with them to bring her home? Unless bringing her home was truly impossible. Lyle's cousin, Malcolm, then told the police that he'd met with Lyle at the Herring's home shortly after Leslie disappeared. According to Malcolm, Lyle was acting erratically and saying things like he was going to burn in hell for what he did to Leslie. Malcolm was unsure of how to react and feared for Leslie's safety. He asked Lyle if he could use his bathroom and employed to get inside the condo and check on Leslie, if she was even there. Lyle considered it before telling Malcolm he didn't think that'd be a good idea. With the sense that something was very wrong, Malcolm left. What would you have done in Malcolm's shoes? Was there anything different he could have even done when confronted with an erratic Lyle? Another cousin of Lyle's, Marvin Thomas, would go on to testify against Lyle. Marvin said that Lyle had called him several times on the night of February 7th, the night Leslie disappeared. Lyle was apparently frantic and said he was tired of everything and wanted to check out. Marvin agreed to meet with Lyle at a nearby Denny's. There, Lyle would also say that he would burn in hell and couldn't come back from what he did. Recall Lyle's internet searches, violent death and the soul, profile of a mass murderer, and 10 common methods of suicide. Is it possible that Lyle really was concerned about his soul? Did he feel genuine guilt or did he fear the prospect of going to hell? Was the search about suicide to help cover up the murder or was it for him? Marvin would say that Lyle looked to be wearing a gun holster with something in it. He was afraid of saying the wrong thing to Lyle and just wanted to get out of there. 
While leaving, Marvin said he witnessed Lyle place a large plastic bag in the back of his car. The bag appeared to contain a woman's maroon sweater, white tennis shoes, and a pair of blue jeans. Neither Marvin nor Malcolm would confront Lyle during their encounters, likely the smart thing to do. Who knows how poorly Lyle may have reacted in that situation. Next, one of the Herring's neighbors would come forward to the police as well. Around midnight, the neighbor saw Lyle wheeling a dolly way down the hallway to a far back elevator. On the dolly, Lyle had a rolled up carpet. The neighbor estimated the carpet to be wide enough to contain a body. The neighbor said that Lyle had a crazed look on his face, a hoodie pulled up, and was sweating profusely. Lyle apparently either didn't see or didn't acknowledge the neighbor. The police then called for assistance from a cadaver dog. Cadaver dogs are specially trained to pick up the scent of human remains. They function similarly to search and rescue dogs, but are used to find dead bodies instead of living people. This four-legged detective was named Indiana Bones. She would be used to investigate the Herring's condo, as well as both of Lyle's cars, an old Cadillac and a Mitsubishi SUV. Detectives would get a positive hit from Indiana Bones on both vehicles, the trunk of the Cadillac and the back of the SUV. The cars were parked about 200 yards apart in separate garages of their condominium complex. Detective Gable reasoned that after Lyle had killed Leslie, he'd first taken her down to the Mitsubishi SUV since it was parked closer. He then drove her body to the Cadillac in the more distant garage. There, he dumped her body in the trunk until he knew what to do next. How long had he left Leslie in the trunk of the Cadillac? We don't have a definitive answer. But once Lyle figured out his next move, he put her body back in the SUV and drove away to where he'd dispose of her. This was why Indiana Bones got a decomposition hit on both of Lyle's vehicles. But where was Leslie's body? Where did Lyle go off to? The police knew Lyle was their murderer, but they wanted to find Leslie's body before arresting him. Recall how difficult it is to get a conviction on only circumstantial evidence and no body. They put a surveillance team on Lyle to track his movements. The team even planted a GPS tracker on his cars to see if he'd return to wherever he disposed of Leslie. It's fairly common for killers to return to a site where they left a victim's remains. Some derive pleasure from it, almost like visiting a private holy site. Others, like Lyle, do it to make sure everything is alright still, and they're not about to get caught. Sort of the murder equivalent of, did I remember to close the garage door when I left? With Lyle's many attempts to cover up his crimes, checking on the place he'd left Leslie's body was something he was likely to do. He was clearly paranoid about getting caught. Luckily, that meant he was likely to slip up. A few days later, Lyle would inadvertently lead the police to an isolated area of Griffith Park around 6 a.m. Griffith Park is a large Los Angeles municipal park in the Santa Monica Mountains. It's most well known for being the site of the famed Hollywood sign. The location Lyle drove to in the park was about three miles away from the condo he'd shared with his wife of 11 years. Indiana Bones was then called in for assistance once again. The cadaver dog would give the police a positive hit on a dirt mound about 15 feet away from a dumpster. The mound was dug up, but no remains were found. The good work of Indiana Bones could only get them so far, and her involvement in the case would now be over. But the police owed that cadaver dog a lot. Much like the positive hits on Lyle's cars, this find from Indiana would tell the police that human remains had indeed once been on site, but no remains were currently there. What could possibly have happened to them? Police couldn't even confirm that it had indeed been Leslie's body. Per Detective Gable, it's Griffith Park. There's a lot of bodies that get dumped there. But what about the nearby dumpster? The police had a theory. Perhaps when Lyle had returned to the site of Leslie's burial, he'd exhumed her body and transferred her to the dumpster. Maybe he feared that the location he'd chosen wouldn't be a sufficient hiding place. Judging by the stellar work of Indiana Bones, he was right. The trash from the dumpster, along with Leslie's body, would have been taken to a huge LA city dump. From there, recovery was likely impossible. 
the police were now confident with near certainty that they would sadly never recover the body of Leslie Herring. But they were just as confident that Lyle had been her murderer. Despite missing a body, the most important piece of a murder trial, the police went forward. After 14 months of exhaustive investigation, the police appeared at Lyle Herring's Cal State Northridge office. There, they arrested him for the murder of Leslie Herring. Los Angeles Deputy District Attorney Sam Huelfeld handled the prosecution. The challenge, Huelfeld said, was most murders start and end with a body, and here we had to build a case without one. The police and the prosecution saw that all the circumstantial evidence pointed to Lyle. They could only hope that the jury would agree with them. Huelfeld opened the trial by saying, this is a case about a senseless and callous murder of an innocent wife by a calculating husband who tried hard to get away with it. Concerning the lack of a body, he went on to say, it's a case about how that regular middle-aged woman vanished abruptly off the face of the earth four years ago, never to be seen or heard from again, because that husband that killed her got rid of her body successfully. Furthermore, it's about how that husband then started weighing his options, looking for a way out, and planning his escape from justice. Lyle Herring would plead not guilty. His defense attorney, Marvin Hamilton, would say, what this is, and nothing more, is a missing persons case. The case, he said, was built on loose circumstantial evidence. Would that loose circumstantial evidence be enough to convict Lyle without a body? Both Leslie's family and the police hoped so. According to the prosecution, Lyle thought to cover his tracks immediately. They brought up the Starbucks receipt found in Leslie's purse, and the video of him actually making the purchase. Lyle was trying to push that his wife had left him, but no one was buying his story. Lyle had also called Leslie's mother and left a message asking about her whereabouts. At a news conference, he had even played the part of the distraught husband. There, he had been in full view of her family and the police, both of whom strongly believed him to be guilty already. The prosecution also brought up Lyle's trip, or perhaps more correctly, his flight to Mexico. Witnesses testified that he'd shown up in Rosarito Beach with his dreadlocks and goatee already shaved off, maybe to give himself a new look in hiding. The real estate agent he'd spoken with even testified that Lyle had said he was very wealthy and would have more money coming in shortly. Was Lyle just acting erratically in doing so, or was he really hoping for some kind of payout? About a dozen witnesses would testify against Lyle Herring. These included his neighbor, who testified that Lyle had been pushing a dolly with a rolled up carpet down the hallway to an elevator on the night Leslie disappeared. Lyle's cousin, Marvin Thomas, also told the court about his strange meeting with Lyle at Denny's. There, Lyle had mentioned that he thought he was going to burn in hell and appeared frantic and unstable, scaring Marvin. Thomas also testified that Lyle had placed a large plastic bag in the back of his car that contained what looked like a woman's maroon sweater, white tennis shoes, and a pair of blue jeans. This would be the same car that Indiana Bones, the cadaver dog, got a positive hit for human remains on. Was Leslie's body in the car the whole time he was meeting with Marvin, or had Lyle already disposed of her and was now getting rid of the clothing separately? If so, why? We will never have a definitive answer. During the trial, Leslie's brother, Lyndon Telford, would tell the court that Lyle was telling a ludicrous, self-serving tale devoid of any credibility. He further implored the jury that since Lyle had shown no mercy or remorse for Leslie, they should show none for him with their sentencing. Lyle Herring's trial lasted three weeks. It did not take the jury long at all to reach a verdict. On April 8, 2013, exactly four years and two months after Leslie had first gone missing, the trial concluded. The jury found Lyle guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Both the judge and the jury found the circumstantial evidence against Lyle to be overwhelming. According to Detective Gable, Lyle's efforts to cover up the murder were what got him in the end. Maybe if Lyle had just stayed home, Leslie's murder would have never been solved. He would have been much better off if he did nothing. Then we'd have nothing to go on, said Gable. It was his cover-ups that really solidified the case. Lyle's own paranoia about getting caught was what would lead directly to him getting convicted. 
Leslie Herring's remains have still not been found. The only person who could possibly help is Lyle himself. Police and family remain hopeful that one day, Lyle may do the right thing and Leslie can be laid to rest properly. For now though, Leslie's family and friends can rest easier knowing her killer is behind bars. The murder of Leslie Herring was a brutal and awful act by her husband Lyle. However, his many attempts to cover his tracks only made it all the more disturbing. While likely not premeditated and thought out, Lyle did put a lot of work and effort into trying to throw investigators off his trail. On top of it all, Lyle seemed convinced he was going to hell for his actions. If he knew his fate after death, why was he so concerned with getting away with murder in life? Furthermore, why hasn't he ever revealed what really happened to Leslie's body? What do you guys think happened? Are the police most likely correct? Is Leslie's body now unrecoverable in an LA city dump? Or is she buried somewhere in Griffith Park? Please let me know in the comments. Regardless of where her body is, we can only hope her soul is at rest. Thank you for watching another episode of Killer Bites. I'm Brandy. I'll see you next time.